oil. It's a staple in Nigerian kitchens, an essential ingredient in countless beloved dishes. Yet, recently, it has become the center of controversy with concerns about its quality and purity capturing headlines. Amidst this backdrop, one woman is leading a revolution in the palm oil industry. Meet Libby Ofemoke, a Google-trained YouTube strategist and social media enthusiast, content creator, broadcaster, documentary producer, theme maker, social change agent, child protection advocate, and entrepreneur. Libby is the dynamic CEO of Ibom Palm Oil, one of the newest brands in the agro-food processing and packaging industry dedicated to providing pure, unadulterated palm oil to Nigerian homes. With a diverse background in media and advocacy, Libby's journey into the palm oil business was driven by a profound motivation to ensure every Nigerian woman has access to quality, edible palm oil. This mission has not only fueled the success of Ibom Palm Oil, but has also set new standards in the industry. Ibom Palm Oil stands out as a beacon of quality in a market often plagued by concerns over adulteration. Libby's dedication to providing only the best has earned her brand a reputation for excellence, ensuring that every drop of palm oil from Ibom is pure, nutritious and free from impurities. As a social change agent, Libby's influence extends beyond the business. She leverages her expertise in media and advocacy to promote social causes, protect children and drive positive change in her community. Her entrepreneurial spirit is matched by her commitment to making a difference. Join us as we explore the inspiring story of Libby Ofemuke, a woman whose passion for quality and social justice is transforming the palm oil industry in Nigeria. Hello, my name is Libby Ofemuke. I am a filmmaker, a broadcaster who turned a trader. Yes, nicely put, I'm an entrepreneur because I'm an employer of labor. So before I eventually become a trader, I, I used to produce television shows, documentaries, film. And um, sometime a few years ago, I lost my job. And I thought, now that I was out of job, what was I going to do with and the first thing that came to my mind was this product, this Ebon Farms and Foods Limited. I am the CEO of Ebon Farms and Foods Limited, producers of Ebon Palm Oil. Um, this brand had been around for a very long time. Uh, I couldn't go ahead with it because I didn't understand so much. Then it was until I lost my job, it started dawning on me that I needed to do something. It wasn't as if I understood what business was. I couldn't even sell anything. I couldn't sell everything I sold my entire life. I didn't make anything out of it. If I had managed to sell, I sold one and I spent all of it. I mean, I used all the product that I ever sold. And um, until recently, before I started, I thought, okay, why don't I give it a push? And I think I listened to the voice of reasoning and we came about a boom. Palm oil. When I first thought about this business, it was sometime about nine, no, maybe by now it should be like 11 years ago. You know, I wanted to do this, but the, the constraints were just too much. But I'm someone who would always want to try something. I tried and I went all, all out to do, you know, attend the seminars. They told me that, oh, I needed to be here. I went. You know, but by the time I got in, I realized that the people playing in that uh, field were really, really bigger than me. I mean, tiny me, what did I have? No idea, no knowledge, nothing. Then they asked me that I needed to come up with a business plan. I mean, the world was just too big for me. Business plan, from where? Where will I get the money to pay for a business plan? That was the defining moment for me that made me to give up. I gave up on it 
and I disappeared from that space like until I thought, okay, when I lost my job, I was, I'd always wanted to do something for myself, but the fear of always, can I, I, I will resign, I go back to work, I resign, I go back to work. I think I did that about three, four times. But this time around, I was convinced in my spirit that I needed to do something. Because I'm someone who always loved to write down her thoughts, I had to go back to my little diary to pick up um, from where I wrote all the plans about Ebon Palm Oil. And I went all out. I went, I traveled to my village. Ebom is my village name. So I went all the way to my village to understand what it takes to process palm oil. And uh, having understood it, from there I sourced, I bring it back to Lagos and I repackage. You know, so um, it was, the idea, we started the planning in 2019. Then in 2020, um, there are, I think it was a week, a few days to before the uh, COVID lockdown, that was when I arrived in Lagos from my first trip. Shortly after the lockdown, we, we launched. And I mean, that was, it was amazing. I didn't expect the reception that we received on, on Instagram, on, especially on Twitter and Facebook. I'm a very, I'm a very active um, user of those two platforms, Facebook and uh, the X. I mean, ideas were just coming, flying left and center. I'm like, is this what I bargained? I had no idea. It was a wow. I see people had not seen something like it before. So that kind of made me like, Libby, you are in for something big. If you did not understand what you just got yourself involved in, this is actually very big. And that was how the idea became big in my head. And I started from that day onward, I started thinking big, the next plan, the next plan the short-term plan, the long-term plan, the bigger, bigger, bigger plan. And it has been big and big and big and big. For these challenges, I will, I will go a different route in sharing my challenges because when I had that boom experience, like that wow experience, I thought that since this project I had got myself involved in felt really very big, like bigger than me, I needed to start understanding how to put a structure to my business. That's where my journey began. So um, I started learning, taking courses, seminars, conferences, understanding all that I needed. The first challenge was going through the, the NAVDAC. I think, no, the first challenge was having to even uh, register, have a bank account. Then they said it was, I needed the, the SCOMO and my, my account was frozen. I'm like, hey, you have just started and your account is even frozen. You're not even exporting. You have not even started having money in that account. The small money that I just made from launching the brand, let me go and withdraw it and do something else. At, because it was not part of the process, the processes that I was told at the bank, I had to rant. Like, if you want me to do something, you have to give me prior information about this. That went, um, we sorted it, all that was gone and all of that. Then the biggest challenge came when I needed to know what it was to expand the brand. It was the first thing first was for me to access the NAVDAC certification. Boy, but then it was, it was sort of, it was supposed to be easy, but it wasn't easy because it was then they were having this post COVID, um, post-COVID uh, palliative, um, palliative. And unfortunately I couldn't make it because I couldn't meet up with that time frame because the money was really very huge, you know? And I was all excited. Let me go get this thing so that I can even be selling. I got there uh, nine months and after that number did not come out. I'm sure that the person that was in charge of my own um, brand product would have been very tired of me. These are, these are the bottlenecks. And after a while, we get to understand well, the, the advantage of that, you can feel it. Our brands are at different supermarkets because we're able to structure the business. I mean, having to learn how to structure the business is one thing that has like kept us apart from the rest. All right, Libby, it's good to have you again. Thanks for having me. All right. Um, so where do we begin? Um, 
I think the first thing I want to know is whether your business is currently profitable. Off camera, you told me that you started since 2020. And so I want to know so far in the last four years, are you profitable? Yeah, for anyone to have been in business for about four years, okay. that means there's profit. I mean, no one wants to do business that is not profitable. That's true. That's true. Um, other than that, so what would you say your cash flow has been? And what are some of the problems or challenges you had with your cash flow? Mm, at first, it was about understanding cash flow. Okay. You know, everything I want to do in life, I try to have um, the basics, I try to go for formal education to mm. understand. And I was lucky to have mentors who took it upon themselves. Because um, prior to this business, I was able to build some goodwill okay. that helped. Okay. You know, so when, when we launched, it was those goodwill that actually paid for our first sales. So gradually, I, I didn't just start shabby. Mm. I started to understand that I needed to have that structure, which mm. uh, the cash flow is part of the structure. Mm. And that helped. And my mentors, I, I found before, mm -hmm that were in before the business okay. were there to assist. Oh, Lippi, this thing you are doing, you need to do this. Oh, you need to get your account. Okay, I don't know how to get this. <laughs> and this man from Canada was hard to, to tell me. I mean, we had a live session. He was teaching me gradually. I was doing it like religiously. I see. That's how I learned how to I see. I mean, organize my Your, your, your case seems to be different. I think uh, you're lucky to have people that were able to work your hand in the beginning and also be able to equip you with the knowledge lucky. that you need. Um, I think um, another thing I wanted to ask is also um, if you can work us through the level of working capital that is required, you know, um, from when you started and where you are right now. From when I started, interestingly, yeah. you know, I said earlier that I had lost my job when mm -hmm. I looked at the money that I had used, like I was scared. Like if I spend this last money, mm -hmm. how do I survive? Okay. I do intend to go back to full time, you know, to pay the employment. And when I started this, it was about four hundred thousand naira. Like ah, I need to do 20, something. Twenty. Yes. Okay. And I didn't even use all the money. I didn't believe that I could do all of that plus the branding and everything. And yeah, since and from there. The cash flow has been increasing, increasing. I've been investing more and more. Mm -hmm. um, so you invest part of your profit back into the working camp. Absolutely. To grow the working capital. Absolutely. So how, how, how would you describe the level of growth of your working capital from, let's say, four years ago or three years ago when you started? How would you describe that growth? Should I put it in figures or should I Me. just say? As, as much as you're comfortable. Uh, how would I describe? Yeah. It's been, it's been an exponential boost. Okay. It's been, it's been like, okay. that's what I can describe. Okay. And now bringing it back to you as a person, how does that come to now um, financing your personal lifestyle and be able to get up for your name? Okay. That's where it gets dicey because, because I had to understand the cash flow early. Okay. As in, for you to separate your personality from the business, exactly. I understood it early, even though I had to struggle. Mm. But in the last two years, I had to be firm with myself. Mm. Say, hey, this, you have to sort yourself. Mm. You have to start considering paying yourself, yourself. as little as nothing. You mm. just have to, like, somebody will say, your business, my business must love me. Yeah. I had to factor myself into mm. a salary. Yes. And that helped because initially I'm like, I'm, I don't have any money. Oh, business. You know, you have to survive. Yeah. But I, I kind of understood that mm. so that that's also helping to prepare you for other opportunities. Mm. If you need, if you need, if you need loans, mm. you know, they, you have to differentiate your personality from your business. Mm. So I understood that on the journey mm. and that has helped to help me to understand that the best way for me to be able to stabilize that 
mm. I will need to pay myself yes. to sustain my pers my personal life. Yes. That's what I've been able to do. Yes. I'm glad you've been able to learn that because uh, most of the entrepreneurs that we have on this on this uh, chair, many of them, uh, uh, this is a common problem. Uh, and they struggle to understand the fact that they need to start paying themselves or they need to separate their personal finances from the business finances. Before you go further, the reason why I got to understand it mm -hmm. is because I had to seek knowledge. It is when you don't seek knowledge, you become ignorant. Exactly. So that's, you can't get it out of the void. You just have to go out there and seek knowledge. Sometimes that's you have to pay for it. These days, there are free knowledge everywhere. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Um, but also the second layer to that is also that you know if you were to be in the paid employment, um, you'd be looking forward to being promoted, looking forward to having salary increase, and all of that. So now that you've started paying yourself, how are you managing the scale at which you pay yourself, considering the fact that you used to be in paid employment? So how would you say your personal income? It is not even me, like, the paid employment would pay me more, but it would not sustain me as I have, because mm. I have my time. Mm. That was what I struggled with big time. I'm always someone that you give an assignment, I go all out. That's it. I don't have to be supervised. I'm a leader of my, of my own. Mm. So now I'm doing it for myself. Mm. I'm channeling that same energy I gave to some person's um, employment mm. into mine. Mm. So, but then they paid me something that was not substantial for me to be happy. Mm. But with the little I give to myself at my own time and pace, yeah. Yeah. I'm more satisfied. Like it's more satisfa satisfactory okay. for me. Okay. Like I wake up, I still wake up as earlier. Sometimes I wake up 4 a.m. I say, well, I'm going to work. And my friend will be like, how do you do it? You slept around 12. But I, I'm able to do it because okay. I was already doing it. Yeah. So now I'm telling, channeling it into my own personal brand, my business. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm more fulfilled right now mm -hmm. than if I, I mean, it used to be very stressful. You wake up that early in Lagos and you go all out there doing it for myself. Mm -hmm. I feel more reliever. Thank you. And I'm happy for you. Before I leave this particular part, there's one more thing I wanted to say about it. Um, I think the joy of everybody is also the fact that at some point your business pays you more than any other family can pay you. Mine is not paying me that much yes. at all. But yeah. you hope that it will pay Hopefully, you. yeah, we're building to that. Well, what do you think you will need to get to that point? And um, how soon do you see that happen? Okay. Or what do you think you need to do? Okay. Um, there are goals. There are short-term goals. There are long-term goals mm -hmm. that... I we've been able to put put in place. Yeah. However, sometimes you want to get things done, and there are hiccups. I you know, and uh, those hiccups kind of make you like. I think okay. So I think you asked me. I've was it earlier? Have I been at the verge of asking myself, why am I doing this? I didn't answer that. I don't think I have been. But there was twice on two occasions I asked myself, God, you've been giving talent to people. Why give me this very hard one? Feel if it felt at one point felt so hard. Like how did I not just know how to do give the same energy? I'm a broadcaster. I'm a I'm a filmmaker. Just do it and it's easy and you go away. But this is like you have to the layers of layers of layers of to get to the final product of this is like oh. So we had we have our long and short term goals and um, by now there were there was a plan that we had that we ought to have we were supposed to achieve in in August but somehow challenges crept up and that has slowed down but then we're not giving up we still the goal is still on point and we are hoping that by that time that we have framed for ourselves we hope to achieve that plan and you can get paid as much as you would want to if we put that structure in place, yes, I'm very certain about Please that. Please put the structures in place. Um, oh, ni coco. Yeah, I understand. But sometimes also, um, you know, what you'll be hoping for can happen just overnight. You know, the thing with business is that as you're building different layers and all of that, you're getting closer to 
to to to your uh, destination in terms of goals you know, and uh, targets that you set for yourself. So it's better to have the structure in place to be able to compensate yourself more appropriately. But I think also is the other bit that most entrepreneurs also don't understand as yet. You start paying yourself, that's fine, but at, at what scale can that finance your lifestyle? Would you would you have to downgrade your quality of your life because your business cannot pay you as much? If you have to now, you need to also be able to put structures in place to put you to where you want to be in terms of your personal compensation. As, as the fund and the CEO, because if you were to hire a CEO, you know how much you're going to pay. So you might as well factor that in the cost of your business. The last thing I want to talk about is about pricing. Where are you with your pricing? Would you say you're 100% there, or is there any other thing you struggle with when it comes to pricing? For now, with the way, because we are, that there, there, are, there are channels to the final. Um, distribution channel, yeah. uh, our pricing is, but then because we, we know that we have target and goals, that we, once the structure is put in place, our pricing will be um, affected in such a way that it will favor both the buyers and uh, the suppliers. Okay. So all the chain will be affected. So um, it is okay for now, but I feel like I still need to put so much in place to ensure that we are more affordable because mm. I, I am concerned um, about the spread. Mm. Is affordability that enables the spread, despite mm. having in mind that we are, we are a premium brand. Mm. So the competition is really very stiff out there. Mm. And we are aware of it. Mm. So for now, our pricing is, is fair. Mm. I think with regards to that, what I want to say to you is that affordability goal is good uh, because it will give you a comfort. But you also need to understand that affordability means two things. It means that all of your cost and all of your expense is catered for properly in your pricing mm -hmm. with a margin. Mm -hmm. You understand? Sure. So part of that cost line items also include uh, your payroll, which in essence, if the time you start paying yourself appropriately, you, know, you can spread that on your price. Yeah. There's so much to yeah, factor and you can spread that on your price. Mm -hmm. You can every other cost line item you can spread that because it's a part of the element of your price. So understand that affordability does not mean that you can cover your cost with the margin. You have to be to cover your cost with the margin. So okay. it might just be that you are more accommodating with your margin. Mm -hmm. Okay? And understand your gross margin and the target net margin. You understand? So, and also look into your industry and find out what are the average margin. But some people go to their industry and, and look for the prices. Sometimes it's a bit wrong, you know, rather look for the margin because you are positioned as a premium brand, which means that your cost might be more. But if you understand the margin, you just put the industry average in terms of the margin on top of your cost. Then you 